Over at bangthebook.com, I posted the new NFL power ratings update from Danny Vorg, so you can go check that out. I also put up a UFC 218 preview from myself. Uh, we've got game previews for all the NBA and NHL games here today. Parker Michaels' NHL picks, contests, matchup data. We can compare teams side by side. Everything you could possibly need over there at bangthebook.com. We are your one-stop shop for sports betting news and information. Finally, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio is presented by our friends at DSI Sportsbook. You sign up over at DSI using the promo code BTB and the number 25. You get that $25 free bet just for signing up. 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook and 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino as well. At Bet DSI, it's only a game until you bet it. Two guests coming your way here today. The first, Mr. Brad Powers from BradPowerSports.com. Brad, how's it going today, man? It's going well. Good to hear your voice on this fine Thursday morning. All right. Well, we got college football to talk about here with you, and then we're going to chat a little bit of NFL as well. But before we get into that, as I mentioned on the show here, 16 games in college football this week. All of them are previewed over at bangthebook.com. But, man, you've got to be happy for a little bit of a uh, light week here with just 16 games. No, no question. Uh, I mean, when you're usually used to, to 55 games, uh, cutting down – you know, 40 games allows me to probably catch my first breath since, you know, middle of the middle to late August. So uh, it, it's welcomed. Uh, it's not like there is, still isn't work to be out there to be had. And, and for a guy, you know, obviously my, my main specialty is on the college football side, but, uh, you know, also allows me to start taking a, a peek at what's on the horizon. And that would be uh, not only the bowl season, but also, you know, college hoops start starting to get uh, myself, uh, you know, inclinated in, into that. So, uh, yeah, definitely a fresh, and it's more uh, this week just taking a, a breath and, you know, gearing up for, you know, the home stretch here as far as bowl postseason. Obviously, still got four or five weeks left in the NFL. I guess there's actually 24 games for you because you do the FCS playoffs as well, right? I do. Uh, I don't like to, you know, tip my hat before because obviously they're, they're, they're soft lines, but uh, th- there's advantages definitely to be had in the FCS games. And I've had a, a pretty good track record the last three years. And, and, and that's the one where I, I know a lot of people advertise 60, 70, 80% winners. I can tell you, you can get in that 60 some percent range when it comes to uh, the FCS, whether it be F, you know, FCS playoffs or FBS versus FCS games. Uh, it's a very soft market. You know, the only issue is when, when you're dealing and you're running a service, you know, not all your customers can take advantage of them, but for those that can, yeah, that's, there's very few opportunities to take advantage in today's day and age as far as the gambling industry. That's, uh, you know, the kind of the final frontier that, that uh, you know, I, I fully like to take advantage of. Are those games going to be included in the Powers Picks newsletter this week, or do you do a, a separate publication for those? Uh, I just do it strictly for my VIPs because, I mean, let's okay. face it, lines aren't out there. If I, you know, I did my game write-ups uh, and put that out there. I'm not sure w- when the, those lines become readily available for everyone, not only, you know, offshore but also locally here in Vegas. Uh, people, you know, I'm not saying I control markets or anything like that, but I can tell you this, people do read my stuff, and, and if that, you know, I got a strong take on a game, we will not see that line value when that line's posted. You can believe that because I think – a lot of my VIP customers will tell you if I'm putting a strong pick on a v, uh, on an FCS game, uh, chances of that line moving three to seven points are pretty great. Well, we'll have to keep an eye out for that in the market. And, of course, uh, good luck with the FCS playoffs here this year. Let's go ahead and start with these FBS uh, Conference Championship games. We're going to do all the Power 5 ones here today, and then we're also going to touch, touch on a way under the radar Sunbelt game. But let's start Friday night here, USC takes on Stanford. The Trojans now up to four out there in the marketplace. Surprised by this move, Brad? Not surprised. That, that was one where I bet earlier in the week, got USC down at minus three, figured it would move up. Uh, you know, four, look, I mean, you got 16 games, and it's a conference championship game. It's a pretty tight number. I mean, when, when I put my line, and I always put my line side or total before, you know, the lines come out. And I, you know, looking at my sheet here, uh, my line said USC four total fifty eight. Looking at the market, it's four and fifty eight right now. So that's kind of what you're dealing with. I bet the three because uh, I thought the number should be four at the current line. Uh, I don't see a tremendous amount of value. But here's why I originally bet USC minus three. I think it's a great situational spot for USC. Obviously, they're off a, a rare late season buy. You know, I, I can't recall a team ever in the history of any conference championship game coming off a regular season buy. So very unique 
outlier situation in favor of USC. And meanwhile, Stanford on the other side has played five straight games and that, that have been decided in the fourth quarter. I mean, there's just don't scoreboard uh, watch. I mean, yeah, it shows that Stanford beat Notre Dame 38-20, to 20, but they actually trailed that one early in the fourth quarter before the Irish meltdown and had three turnovers. And then the other factor is you go back to the first meeting between these two. USC dominated the game. I mean, they won by 18, probably should have won by more. They outgained Stanford by nearly 300 yards, uh, and they dominated the line of scrimmage, ran for over 300 yards. I mean, Stanford hasn't allowed more than 300 yards rushing pretty much in the last decade. So that's a heck of a lot of ground to make up in the trenches in just a couple of months. And a lot of that is something that's not going to get cured, uh, you know, just by a game plan. A lot of that's going to be, you know, personnel-driven. The only hang-up for me is, you know, Stanford's a pretty good dog. Uh, they're playing close to home. And the North Division champ has never lost the Pac-12 title game. So that would be my only, you know, hang-ups for back in USC. But obviously, <laughs> happy with the three ticket. Four still would be a slight lean USC. But I, I think the overall numbers are almost right on the money at this point. That's interesting. I've got this one down below a field goal personally. And, of course, I would trust your numbers over my own, especially at this time of the year. But, you know, th- this is one of those situations to me where you look at that first meeting between the two teams. Stanford played that game in Australia, had to come back. You know, they had a little bit of extra time for that USC game, but it was still a, a strange scheduling situation for them. Then we saw the carryover to that San Diego State game. Since then, they've been a pretty good team. And without Bryce Love healthy, you know, they struggled against Oregon State, didn't do much against Washington State, but only lost by three on the road. I think Stanford's a team that is improved by a decent margin you know, from that first game when these two teams played. And also, I like the point you brought up about that regular season bye. I think that's something that's very big for USC in this spot. But Stanford has a clear coaching advantage here. I don't think much of Clay Helton. I don't think the national perception is all that high of Clay Helton. That's the one thing that kind of concerns me about people that want to take a USC stance. Yeah, no, and, and let me clarify, when you said your number is under a field goal, I can tell you my pure power rating is under a field goal on this game. Uh, I just think the situational spot is probably one of those rare instances in a conference championship game to me that's worth, you know, a point, point and a half or so at least. You're right, coaching mismatch here. I'd much prefer David Shaw over Helton. Uh, although I don't think Helton is as bad as what everyone makes it out. I mean, uh, Look, he's got talent there, but USC's had talent the last six, seven, eight years. He's got him the back-to-back double-digit win season. So it's not like, I mean, he, he's terrible on the sidelines there. Uh, and, and give them credit. I, I mean, I thought their season really could have, you know, taken a bad uh, play, especially after Notre Dame beat them 49-14. They immediately rebounded after that, blew out Arizona State, and really took care of business down the stretch. And they were pretty banged up. The fact that, you know, why, why is the buy to me worth a point or so? It's because, you know, they're getting healthy. And that was a team already playing pretty good football, being banged up at the end of the year. So, uh, look, uh, you're pretty splitting hairs here. I, you know, if someone told me, yeah, I really like Stanford plus four, I could get that. I can just tell you I'm pretty happy with my USC minus three ticket. The last point I want to bring up about this game, because this is something that I've been looking at in all the conference championship games where we have rematches, is comparing that first game. And you did that. You mentioned USC won by 18, dominated the game on the ground. That number was USC minus three and a half in Los Angeles. So now we're at four on a neutral site. And it's just been kind of interesting to me and, and sort of fascinating to look at how the previous meeting has been incorporated into the lines for some of these games. Now, I don't know how much this one has been because this game was played, you know, almost three months ago back on September 9th. So I don't know, you know, how much bearing that game has, but you can see it in some of the other games like Florida Atlantic and North Texas. It feels like the first meeting between those two teams very clearly built into the line, Georgia and Auburn. It doesn't feel like it's all that built into the line. So that is something that's kind of interesting to compare and contrast here in conference championship week. It is. I will say, you know, the three and a half probably was a close, you know, USC was, I mean, Stanford money from the sharps, the public, the whole world was on Stanford in that first game. I mean, I, I did bet that game early in the week and had a Stanford plus seven ticket. So at least the opening, you know, market on that game way back on September the 9th, you know, did have USC favored by you know, a full touchdown. It's just, you know, all the late money and the late money, like in a lot of cases this year on game day and everything will just prove to be wrong. So I don't think it's been a significant line change here. And again, I think the situational spots probably 
worth a point or so, and it's probably built into the number as far as the spot. All right, let's go to Saturday here, and we'll talk about a game that no one's really going to talk about, game 309-310 on the board. Georgia Southern takes on Coastal Carolina. Georgia Southern open pick in this game. They're now a two-and-a-half-point favorite. And, and this is a really interesting spot for both of these teams because as it turns out, Georgia Southern is going to go ahead and head coaching job to Chad Lundford, who was the interim when Tyson Summers got fired. Coastal Carolina, without their head coach this year, in their first year transitioning to FBS, uh, Joe Moglia took a uh, – medical leave of absence you know, this game opens pick them coastals only won one game this year or two games this year although they played very very well against arkansas nearly knocked them off on the road but georgia southern a couple of wins in a row here and you know what about this line mover are you surprised to see georgia southern taking on some money here do you, do you think this is a throwaway game for both teams what do you think no i'm not surprised at all for power ranks probably got georgia southern too so i get the initial line move uh and look, I mean, they've been dominant. They've been a completely different team the last couple of weeks, running for 356 yards and 389 yards in back-to-back wins. They've covered the closing number by a combined 74 points. So not surprised at all to see Georgia Southern getting the money. I would, you know, if you really wanted a Georgia Southern ticket, I would have preferred them not to name uh, Lunsford as the permanent head coach because you get maybe one more uptick game where they're really playing for it because he's playing for the job. The fact that they've named him the head coach, you know, I'm not saying it's a negative, but to me it's kind of a neutral. I, I would actually prefer that they, they try to win one more game for him to get the, you know, solidify him, uh, himself as the permanent head coach. You know, the other thing here, Coastal Carolina, extra time to prep for the option coming off a very late season bye. At the current number, I'm not going to get too involved, but I'll be honest with you. I went against Georgia Southern with uh, one of my better plays. Well, well, it didn't turn out to be a better play, but as far as one of my top plays last week, because I thought it was an outlier performance, their 52 nothing win against South Alabama, that proved to be completely wrong. So I'm not looking to line up against Georgia Southern again here. Maybe, you know, you know the, the permanent head coach is the real deal there, and they just need to get rid of Tyson Summers out of that program, get them away, because they have looked even a little bit better in some, you know, losses. Georgia State, that they had a late drive that got stopped. Otherwise, they would have won that game outright. So he just might be the real deal. And you cannot, at least at this point, talk me into Coastal Carolina plus three. For me, it's Georgia Southern or nothing. Yeah, my number on this game was two and a half. So, you know, I, I mean, the, the number has moved toward me. And, and one of the things I think that's really interesting about this game is that if Coastal Carolina hadn't won on the road in Idaho – uh, in their last game a couple of weeks ago, I think they would have been in a play on spot here because you don't want to go winless in conference play in your first year in the Sun Belt. You, you just don't want to do it. So maybe the players would have been a little bit more motivated in that regard. Now, it is nice to possibly go into the offseason with a couple of wins in a row, but not having that zero in front of the dash in your conference record, kind of a sigh of relief there for a team that has had a lot of issues coming over to FBS this year. I mean, They've had some games where they played well. They played well against Georgia State, played very well against Appalachian State. As I mentioned, nearly beat Arkansas without their head coach, with a bunch of quarterback injuries, and transitioning over to FBS, where they're operating at a bit of a disadvantage because they've had fewer scholarships the last few years and that type of thing. So, you know, maybe Coastal does come out motivated here, but like you said, Georgia Southern just looks like a different team with Lunsford, who you know, was the director of recruiting for Auburn for four years. So, this is a guy that can isolate talent, can see talent, has a good eye for talent, especially in the running game. Georgia Southern might be a team to look at next year because their season win total should be low, two, two and a half maybe. Maybe that's a team that can get it, it straightened out. Oh, I, I'll i bet you right now on that two, two and a half. It'll be higher than that. I, I think they take more of, you know, and kudos to them, I think they take more of a, uh, you know, a three, four-year trend line to see what their season win total is in that than just to overreact to one single season. So uh, I think it'll be higher than that, and, and it is a play on team. Uh, you know, one thing you did bring up I that, that I agree with, you know, th- I don't think this is a throwaway game for either team. I mean, the fact that Georgia Southern can finish with three straight wins, Coastal Carolina can win back-to-back some belt games, that, you know, a lot can be won here as far as, you know, heading into the off season, uh, you know, and setting up your program for, for the future, obviously. So I do think it's an important game for both. I'm just going to throw this little nugget out there. You know, there was a sharp, big-time sharp guy that had very deep pockets when I was standing in line betting season win totals all the way back on Memorial Day weekend. 
uh, Ralph Michaels and myself, and their number one play was Coastal Carolina under five and a half wins. Uh, I'm gonna, you know, if I see that those particular faces up there again this upcoming year, I, I'll be paying attention to what they're betting. I found that very peculiar that that would that they really jumped on Coastal Carolina and obviously have been right on the money so far. All right, let's go to the Power Five Conference Championship games here. We'll start with Georgia and Auburn in the SEC. Auburn now a two-point favorite out there in the market, a couple two-and-a-halves. Bovada, obviously we know that they tend to uh, shade toward the public side. They're three even money on Auburn. This line's coming down a little bit, Brad. Is that what you expected? Yeah, pure power rating for me has probably got one-and-a-half. Keep in mind, Georgia just a few weeks ago was laying two-and-a-half or three points on the road at Auburn, so – Look, there's been an adjustment made. Auburn crushed uh, Georgia 40-17, then obviously took care of Alabama. So it, you definitely uh, got to make the adjustment a little bit. But really, uh, look, I thought it was, you know, as far as that spot there was a tough spot for Georgia. Uh, I had Auburn as one of my top plays of the week. So, I, I mean, obviously I was stunned at 40-17. wasn't stunned that they pulled the outright upset. You know, Georgia's really only had one bad game all year, <laughs> that being the Auburn game. But, uh, you know, outside of that, they won 10 games by 14 points or more. Uh, They won on the road at Notre Dame earlier in the year. I mean, and they haven't extended a lot of effort the last two weeks since the Auburn loss, blowing out Kentucky and Georgia Tech. They're going right back up to Atlanta. You'd have to expect they'd probably stay at the same uh, team hotel. So I think that you could shade a little bit of home field advantage for them. They're playing closer to home, and they were just up there uh, last week. Auburn not in a good spot. They're off their biggest margin of victory over Alabama in the Iron Bowl since 1969. They're banged up. There's some cluster injuries at the running back spot. Uh, for me, uh, I'm back in Georgia. We would have really liked, you know, a plus full field goal. I don't think I'm going to ever see it here, even though the public looks like it's on Auburn. Uh, it's going to go down to the wire. It's not a, a big value play for me this week, but uh, I'm definitely leaning with the Bulldogs. What I think would be really intriguing about this game, if Georgia does win, you know, people are talking about Alabama's resume, Alabama's strength of schedule, that type of thing, you know, if Flor- if Fresno State and Auburn both lose, you know, then, I mean, Alabama, for them, I mean, if, if they can hang their hats on saying, hey, you know, we played two conference champions, we know that Fresno State, they were going to blow Fresno State out no matter what, but the committee can form narratives and, and all that type of thing. If, if people can say, hey, Alabama played two conference champions, you know, maybe that's something that kind of works in their favor. So I'd be really intrigued to see, you know, if people – hurt Alabama with a Georgia win. I think that's the the more compelling thing about this game to me. I don't think there's any value on the number. I think it should be a good football game. I think Georgia should be much better prepared this time around. But that's kind of what I'm wondering is is what the additional implications might be in terms of who wins this game. Uh, Yeah, I I mean, let's just put it out there. I mean, whoever wins is in, even though Georgia's, you know, down there at like, what, what, number six in the current playoff rankings. I mean, they'll, they'll jump a few teams, but obviously jump Alabama and Auburn, in my opinion. But you're right. I think if I, I, I you know, throwing it out there, I think if I'm an Alabama supporter and want them in the playoffs, I think I would prefer Auburn to win this game because, therefore, your only loss on the season would be to, you know, the, the number one or number two team in the country on the road. So I think if I'm Alabama, and I know it's a tough pill to swallow, I think the preference for them would be for Auburn to win the, the SEC championship game here. Otherwise, your only loss then becomes to a team that lost three games on the season. So, yeah, I think Alabama, slight support uh, with Auburn here to win this one. Do you agree with the line move on the total, with the total coming down from 51 to 47? Yeah. Uh, my, I'm looking at my notes here. My line on the total is 47. Uh, shame on me for not getting uh, you know advantage uh, earlier on that one. Uh, you, you look at a lot of the SEC title games outside of these blowouts with uh, you know Alabama and Florida here recently, and you know the, the under's been you know a lot of a lot of times the way to go. So uh, I think adjustments will definitely be made uh, on both sides, and I think it'll be more of a lower scoring defensive battle here, especially if Auburn is not healthy at running back. I mean that's what they took advantage of Georgia in the first game. They really ran it down their throats. I think Auburn's defense matches up well with Georgia. We've seen them really match up well against Alabama and Georgia here recently. I think that's the same thing here. I mean, Georgia, you know, if I'm back in Georgia here and I am, you know, the worry that I have, I still haven't seen Jake Fromm win a football game, uh, you know, via the air. He's going to have to here if they're going to win the game outright. So uh, th- that's a legitimate question. I think, uh, you know, there's might be a little bit more of a correlated parlay here, dog and under. 
Well, I think the flip side of that coin then is, have we seen Jarrett Stidham go out and win a game for Auburn? I mean, he played very well on the road against Texas A&M, threw for 268 and three touchdowns, had three touchdowns against Georgia, but he only had to throw the ball 23 times for 214 yards because, as you said, they ran it down their throat. So you could also ask the same question about Jarrett Stidham. And with all the running back injuries for Auburn, you know, if he has to go out there and make a bunch of plays, can he do it? I, I don't know. I, I think this is kind of a high-variance game because of – that uncertainty at the quarterback position coupled with Auburn's running back injuries. Uh, no, great point. I mean, the only really close – and look, these two teams have not been playing close games all year, so it's going to be interesting to, to see if you know how either one reacts in a close game situation. You know, Georgia, the Notre Dame game was close to other than that. Uh, I mean, they haven't been involved in too many, you know, one-possession type of games, and that's going way back to early September. Auburn – you know, really the only close game they've been involved here in conference play was on the road at LSU. Didn't handle it well. They blew a 20 to nothing lead. Jared Stidham had one of his worst games of the season. I think he was like 9 out of 26. You know, Alabama game was a little nip and tuck there for a while. But you know, let's face it, middle of the fourth quarter, they're up, to, you know, two scores. So, yeah, I completely agree. I would – this one, to me, more of a popcorn game. Uh, you know, moving forward to see if I can find value on either – whoever wins the game in the college football playoff. But – you know, if I'm a supporter of Auburn or Georgia, yeah, sure, I, I'd like to win in a blowout fashion. But I think for the future of the team moving towards the college football playoff, I would like to see my young quarterback maybe lead a come-from-behind win or make significant plays in a very tight game. That would make me a little bit more confident moving forward. All right, let's go to the ACC here. We'll head on out to Charlotte. Miami takes on Clemson. Clemson about a nine-point favorite in this one. There are a couple of tens out there, Bovada being one of them, so – Kind of tells you what the public side is here. But the Sharp guys also hit Clemson early in the week to drive this number up from 7.5 to 9. First question, before we break this game down in, in detail and look at some of the matchup stuff, does Clemson get a home field advantage playing in Charlotte? Oh, yeah. Hey, and not just one point. I, I'm more towards 1.5 or 2 points here. I mean, Miami's never been known to travel very well. Um, and obviously Clemson's played here multiple times. Didn't last year because of the, you know there was you know some political stuff, and it ended up playing in Orlando. But yeah, I fully expect 75% of the crowd to be <laughs> wearing the orange of Clemson and not uh, you know the green and orange of Miami. So yeah, you if you're doing a pure power rating, you at least at the bare minimum need to you know shade at least one point in Clemson's behalf as far as home field advantage goes. All right, so let's look at this game because what I find really interesting about it is that, you know, people, a lot of people out there that are considered to be sharper, and I know some of the guys I've had on this show and, and some of the guys whose opinions I respect have been dying to find spots to go against this Miami team because Miami had that close win over Florida State, had that close win over Georgia Tech, didn't look great against Syracuse, didn't look great against North Carolina. Then they have their two hallmark games against Virginia Tech and Notre Dame perceptions maybe change a little bit. Maybe people kind of say, you know what? I was down on this team. I was skeptical of this team. Maybe they're a little bit better than I thought. Then they have the two performances they had against Virginia and Pitt. Trailed Virginia into the third quarter, lost at Pitt, a game that truthfully didn't matter a whole lot to them, but still not a very good look for Mark Rick's team. And Mark Rick kind of has that you know, reputation at Georgia of, of not being able to win these big games. He got the Bulldogs the SEC championship game wasn't able to get a whole lot done there in those. So it feels like people are worried about Miami this week. Should they be as worried as they are? Yeah, I think there's legitimate concerns to be worried. Look, we've seen Miami play the level of their competition, but, but you know, the difference obviously between the Virginia Tech Notre Dame games and this Clemson game, both of those were primetime spots at home at night uh, in home run spots. And let's be honest, has Virginia Tech and Notre Dame really set the world on fire since those games? No. I mean, you could have been dealing with a couple of overrated 9-3 and three teams. I can tell you who's not overrated is Clemson Tigers under Dabo Sweeney. <laughs> Last week, I did go against them and shame on me for doing so. This is Dabo time this time of year. And obviously, they took care of South Carolina and Will Muschamp in dominating fashion on the road. And speaking of, you know, why is it Dabo time? Well, you look at the last five years as far as postseason games. And I'm counting ACC championships, bowl games, playoff games, national title games, 9-1 and one straight up, 9-1 and one against the spread. Now, a lot of those roles were in the underdog role. I think you're paying a little bit of a premium now on the Dabble Sweeney tax. But they've been there, done that uh, in these big games. Miami, yeah, they won at home against VT and Notre Dame, but this is their very first chance 
and an ACC championship game, and I'm wondering if the spotlight might be a little too big for him. And I'm also worried about the confidence of their quarterback, Rogier, who was pulled in the fourth quarter of that game because he wasn't getting the job done. So, uh, you know, anything in single digits, I'm going to lean towards Clemson. Not one of my favorite plays. You know, pure power rating has got this game right around nine. So, again, another very sharp line, as to be expected this time of year. But, you know, I'm leaning towards Clemson. They're just a more trustworthy team for me. And you and I had this conversation at dinner on on Monday night talking about Dabo Sweeney and about how not only is this dude a really damn good head coach, he seems like a really good person in general, too. You know, we we talked on this show before about, you know, when he went out to congratulate Dino Babers after that Syracuse win and and how – you know, how classy he was about that, went to the Syracuse locker room after the game. This is a guy that he doesn't just get it from a football standpoint. He gets it from a leader of men's standpoint and and in terms of molding young minds and and turning these guys, you know, from high school football players into college football players into, you know, adults. And, And that's something I think resonates when you talk about games like this, where you need, you know, razor sharp focus. You need guys to be paying attention to film study. You need guys to be, going through practice reps at 100%. It helps he's got a great defensive coordinator in Brett Venables, but this is a guy that just has his teams ready to go, and it's hardly a coincidence that he's 9-1 and one straight up and against the spread in those big-time games. Now, I think Mark Rick can be that guy at Miami. I just don't know if this is the right team and, and the right situation for him to showcase that. Yeah, the, there's going to be future opportunities for Miami. They're, they're a little bit ahead of schedule, and I think Mark Rickwood even told you they're ahead of schedule. I mean, you know, prior to the pit loss of what had the long, nation's longest winning streak at, what, 14, 15 games, they're ahead of schedule. And you start peeking at future recruiting rankings, uh, Miami's not going anywhere. And, and, you know, obviously the question's still going to remain going to be out there, can Mark Rick win the big game? But I'll tell you what he's going to do. He's going to win a lot of games uh, at Miami, a lot more than what they've been used to winning here the last decade. So, I'm not so concerned about Miami's future under Mark Rick. It's more this particular matchup and this particular team this year that's been really living off that turnover chain. They were number one in the country in turnover margin. I don't know. I mean, if they get it, then obviously they'll be in the game here. But if you know Kelly Bryant's not turning the football over, then Clemson's clearly the right side here. All right, let's slide down one spot on the board game, 327, 328. We're kind of in a holding pattern with this line. This number opened Ohio State five and a half. Up to six and a half. We haven't seen it hit seven yet. I think once we get some clarity on the JT Barrett situation and see if he's going to start and then, of course, how much he may actually play in this game, I think we start to see that Ohio State money just avalanche into the market because, look, Wisconsin is a team that you have to respect. They haven't lost a game yet. They haven't played anybody really yet. I mean, the best offense they've faced is Florida Atlantic. But from a power rating standpoint, you have to respect them. You have to put them up there in the top 10 and the top 12 because – you know what their lines are going to look like each week. So when you set this number based on the line or based on the power ratings that you have, it's going to be under a touchdown. But the talent gap between these two teams, I think merits something higher. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. You know, pure power rating, uh, yeah, it should be four, four and a half. You know, pure talent rating and head coaching talent, I mean, maybe closer to double digits. So, you know, I understand where it's sitting, where it's at. All right, I mean, look, I'm going to bet Wisconsin, but you said it very well. If you're looking to bet Wisconsin, do not do not bet them now. Do not have a six, six-and-a-half ticket. Don't be that guy. If you're looking to bet Wisconsin, I promise you, wait until game day or close to, to the, the, you know, the kickoff. I think you're going to find some sevens, maybe uh, some square books, some seven-and-a-halves out there. Wait until game day like I am because I am going to bet Wisconsin in this one, and I'll tell you why. If I'm looking to back Ohio State, laying a touchdown against a team that's only allowing 12 points per game on the defensive side of the ball. Well, I need to have, a, you know, a lot of my check, you know, check marks, you know, checked obviously for this game. And I got two major questions, one on offense, one on defense offense. How healthy is JT Barrett? Yeah. He might play. Is he going to be a hundred percent? Cause I would like to think he was significantly injured. The fact that he couldn't finish the final game against Michigan you know, becoming the you know, first player ever to win four straight starts in the Ohio State-Michigan rivalry, for him to take himself out of that game would, to me, say, hey, that's just not him being nicked up. That's him being, you know, not just hurt and banged up and bruised. That's him being injured. Now, Haskins did well, leading the come-from-behind win, but uh, I, I don't think that the marketplace is purely reflecting JT Barrett being less than 100%. And then the other side of the ball, defensive side, 
their defensive coordinator, Greg Schiano, had the Tennessee job on Sunday, pulled out of it, and now we see nothing but drama. Is he going to sue or not? You know, is he – look, he's focused for the game, but is he 100% focused with the game plan and everything for this Wisconsin team? You know, as long as Hornybrook's not throwing picks, and that's the biggest question and biggest concern I have back in Wisconsin here, as long as he's not turning the football over, I think Wisconsin keeps it close, which is what they've done last 38 games. No team has beaten Wisconsin by more than seven points. Give me the Badgers. Of all the games we've gone over, betting them at plus seven at post or on game day is probably my favorite play. I mean, everybody knows I'm an Ohio State fan, but I, I look at this situation and, you know, I mean, not even thinking about the 59 to nothing shellacking that Ohio State gave Wisconsin a few years ago that probably did propel them into the college football playoff. Wisconsin just can't stack up to me. I mean, this is a defense that's been on the field for only 24-46 per game because they haven't played any offense worth anything. The combined average yards per carry of the offenses they've played this year, 4.3 yards per carry. Ohio State's got almost six yards per carry. Now, yeah, maybe the offensive playbook changes a little bit with Haskins as opposed to Barrett, and that certainly would be something you know you kind of want to wait and watch about, and that's why this line hasn't moved as much as it has. But Wisconsin's played nobody. And if you're in week 14 of the season and probably the best opponent you've played is either Florida Atlantic or Northwestern, I'm sorry, that just doesn't do it for me. You know, I mean, the Wolverines just (laughs) couldn't do anything on offense. They only had 10 points against Wisconsin. They didn't do much on offense against Ohio State either. So that's the, the problem that I have is I need Wisconsin to be able to prove it to me. So if Wisconsin can prove it to me, I feel like I can get six and a half or something better than that at some point live during the game because if Ohio state starts fast and Wisconsin, you know, is moving the football, then maybe I can reevaluate there, but I need Wisconsin to show it to me before I'm going to invest in them against an Ohio state team that we we know what Ohio State's ceiling is. We know what their floor is too, because they lost to Iowa by 31, but we know what their ceiling is. And I would expect an urban Meyer team to play much, much closer to its ceiling than its floor in a spot like this. You would think, but I mean, Look, how, how, they, how many times this season have they played to their ceiling? Michigan State? Because, you know, they, they full 60 minutes of football, I didn't see it against Michigan last week, down 14 to nothing in a rivalry game. Didn't see it against Oklahoma, obviously, slow start there, uh, and obviously getting beat by double digits. Didn't see it against Penn State uh, in, in a game that they trailed by 18, saw it in the you know, third, late third and fourth quarter as far as their ceiling. Didn't see it in last year's college football playoff. Didn't see it for a full 60 minutes against Michigan last year. Didn't see it against Michigan State on the road last year. Didn't see it against Penn State on the road last year. I mean, I've, I've not seen Ohio State really at their ceiling going back to the three games at the end of the 2014 season. And everyone talks 59 nothing. These two teams just played last year an overtime game that Wisconsin led in the fourth quarter. So, uh, look, I know they haven't played anyone this year, but at least the last two or three seasons say – Wisconsin, when they're playing elite talent, whether it be an LSU or Ohio State or, you know, some, some of these other teams, no one's been able, even, you know, Michigan was, you know, at least from a power ratings perspective, uh, a team that was a top four or five team last year. That was on the road. No one's been able to get margin on Wisconsin dating back to the season opener in 2015 when they lost by 18 to Alabama. I'm just – I know the soft schedule, and that's a, a concern. But, man, I – I'm more concerned with Ohio State's inconsistency here the last two or three years because you're right. Their ceiling is number two in the country, only behind Alabama, and I haven't seen it from a a game-in and game-out perspective outside the Michigan State game this year. That's perfectly fair. My counter would be, yeah, they had the problems against (laughs) Penn State, and they had the two turnovers in the first half that, you know, led to short fields. Penn State had 283 yards in that game. They had 2.6 yards per carry with Saquon Barkley. I mean, it's a team that had over 450 yards per game this season and Ohio State held them to 283, and they did nothing in the second half of that game. So we'll have to see. I mean, you know, Ohio State has fallen on the big stage before. I don't think they fall to a team with Wisconsin's talent level, but you know, I guess we'll just have to see how that one plays out. And uh, good back and forth. It's nice when we disagree, because I don't think we disagree uh, as much on this show as you know I would like to. But uh, one more game to hit on here from a college football standpoint, 333-334, TCU, Oklahoma. Oklahoma favored by a touchdown, and – we had some pretty interesting discussions about this game on Monday night at dinner. Yeah, we we did. And uh, I bet Oklahoma early. Uh, again, that's probably been my biggest strength this year, just anticipating line moves and, you know, me becoming more of a better seeing it through that. And I bet Oklahoma five and a half. I was at the trap 
cashing season win totals, and I just happened to look up and saw they had it post. I'm like, wow, that, that number is going to seven. It's definitely not going down to four. So, But I, I'll tell you what, the current seven, but, you know, it's, again, I mean, I hate to say it, but the, that seven number sounds about right to me uh, from a, not only a pure power ratings aspect, but when I start factoring revenge situation and everything, uh, I'm going to wait and, and try to really middle it at a six or a seven. I, I anticipate the money that to come in on Oklahoma because, let's face it, you got uh, – the NFL favorites have been cashing at a historical rate. You have, you know, you don't have a full college football card this week. You got a bunch of isolated big time championship games. So I think the NFL money, uh, as far as the favorites, probably is going to trickle down to the college guys. Maybe got guys that don't bet college football on a regular basis, but bet the big championship games, bet the big bowl games, and that. I think that money is going to come in on Oklahoma, and I'm going to end up having a TCU ticket. Uh, getting more than a touchdown here. And the reason I lean that way is, you know, I go back to the first meeting, and that's the overall question I have. Oklahoma was up 38-14. Didn't score a single point in the second half of that game. Now, was that TCU making adjustments, or was that Oklahoma laying their foot off the gas? You know, I sometimes I give Gary Patterson a lot the benefit of the doubt because we've seen his second-half adjustments this year, and they've allowed in our last six games in the second half a total, a total of seven points in their last six Big 12 games in the second half. Uh, I'll trust the better, the team with the better defense, which I have here in TCU, getting the touchdown, playing close to home where they can sleep in their beds at night, you know, just a, a little, you know, 20, 30-minute drive there. Uh, I, I'm going to take the, the Horn Frogs here plus the points, but this is another one where if you're looking to bet TCU, bet them on game day, I think you're going to get seven and a half. And I'm also going to lean towards the under here. I, I like the under at 63 and a half. Uh, you know, Oklahoma's defense sometimes in big games has played up the snuff, whether it be against Texas or Ohio State. This is a big performance here. And, again, I, I like what I saw from TCU against Oklahoma in that second half. So uh, I'm going to bet the under as well. TCU and the under at the current numbers. Yeah, my number is basically right here at seven. It's actually seven and a half. When you factor in the home field advantage element for TCU because they are so close to home, you know, then, then that's something that probably drops it down to seven, maybe six and a half. Interesting that the first game between these two teams – in Norman was Oklahoma minus five and a half. So, you know, a little bit of an adjustment there based on what we saw and probably based on the TCU injury situations as well with Kenny Hill, you know, kind of being out of the lineup a little bit and the backup quarterback being hurt as well. But man, what you said about Gary Patterson just, just rings so true. And, and Lincoln Riley has done a hell of a job with this Oklahoma team. He's done a fantastic job. I'd be curious what this number would be with Bob Stoops, if that would make any kind of difference to the line or anything like that. But there's something about this game. There's something about the lack of chaos that we have right now that makes me think this early game in this 12 o'clock, 1230 time slot is the one that sort of throws everything off. I, I mean, if, if I get a seven and a half, I'll play it. And I'll also look to sprinkle the TCU money line. I could be way off. Baker Mayfield could go out there, drop dimes all day long. Oklahoma could run away with this one. I just don't think that's going to be the case. And this could be that game that settles that Ohio State Alabama discussion by just knocking Oklahoma out altogether. I, yeah, and that's what we talked about over dinner, and I have that feeling as well. Now, look, is that going to be you know lead me to giving TCU as a pick? No, I can't. But man, just having that gut feeling, me as a better taking a chance because I do agree with you. There's some high variance here. I would not be stunned if Oklahoma won by three touchdowns. I'll just put that out there. But I, I just have this sneaky suspicion, and when you follow college football. Look, it's very tough to predict 18 to 19 to 20 year old kids, but sometimes it is when you look at past history. And this game just has all the makings. Everyone's talking about the SEC title game, Georgia Auburn. You know, Miami Clemson, the winner probably is in the playoffs in that one. Ohio State, Wisconsin. Ohio State, can they make the playoffs? Wisconsin wins their end. The game no one's talking about usually is the game that, you know, upsets the whole Apple card. And I would not be stunned, especially a Gary Patterson motivated. Keep in mind, there's that story out there that. You know, the Oklahoma quarterbacks are, are, you know, picking off the TCU defenders when they're running through the lineups in, in the in the pregame of the last week's game. Gary Patterson's a guy that has an axe to grind if you give him the, the right motivation. Would not be stunned if TCU won the game outright. It just has that feeling to me, and I'm just basing it on what I've seen. And the Big 12 championship game, also, it, it would kind of almost serve them right, their overreaction, just because of what happened in 2014. Hey, we got to get a championship game. No, you don't. Oklahoma would be in the playoffs right now if you didn't have one. It could come back to bite them, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised that having a conference championship game eliminates them this year. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and we'll see. It, this is this could wind up being a moot discussion and Oklahoma wins by 28. But I, I don't know. <laughs> I just feel like that probably won't end up being the case. But if it is, don't say that we didn't warn you. All right, Brad, let's take a couple of minutes on the NFL real quickly here. I, I know that we're kind of running out of time with this segment. Uh, New England and Buffalo, one of the games I want to touch on here this week. Bills coming off of a nice win over Kansas City, but it is a Kansas City team completely free-falling. New England just looks phenomenal now week after week after week. Laying eight and a half, anywhere from eight and a half to ten, a little bit of teaser protection at five dimes with New England at the full ten. Rest of the market eight and a half or nine. Any, any strong thoughts on this game, Brad? Yeah, I'm going to lean towards the Bills. I mean, it's tough. I went up against New England last week. I, I bet the Dolphins gave out the Dolphins. Largest spread in the NFL the entire season. I didn't think it was a great spot for New England coming off a of two altitude games. And if you're going to lay 16 and a half, it's got to be a really good spot. And obviously they still covered the number. They're 7-0 and the last seven games, 6-1 and against the, the number. The defense the last seven games only allowing 13 points per game. And not going to be a premium pick for me, but I do lean with the Bills and shame on them. You know, the Nathan P- uh, Peterman uh, experiment obviously was terrible two weeks ago. Get Taylor back in the lineup. They win. They're right back in playoff discussion. Uh, for them, at least for that franchise at this point in the year, Bills are nothing for me. I take them plus the points. And, and kudos to them for bouncing back because that Peterman thing is something that could have really rattled the locker room. Even going back to Tyrod Taylor, you know, it's kind of a sigh of relief doing that. But still, it might be one of those things where the players are like, why the hell did we bother with this to begin with? But good for them to bounce back against the Kansas City team that, you know, like we said, not playing well, uh, but still really dangerous. How about this one here? 361, 362, Houston and Tennessee. AFC South matchup in this one, Tennessee laying six and a half or seven. And I had this conversation with Brian when we were at the, uh, at the golden Knights game or when we were drinking beforehand, one of the two, uh, it seems like Tennessee is really highly rated in the minds of a lot of smart people. I know, uh, you know, from our power ratings over at bang they're rated very high pro football focus likes a lot of their individual players. It just seems like they're mispriced week after week. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, they are the bane of my existence in my NFL handicapping this year. I, in the last four weeks, I've lost three games, uh, and they're involving them by half a point each time. I mean, I backed them, uh, against the, you know, Baltimore and, and Cincinnati lost them games when I backed Tennessee by half a point each game. Then last week, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take Indianapolis plus the, the three and a half. That was, you know, an early number was four, four and a half. So, you know, kudos to all those that got it. But, you know, for most people, it was three and a half. And obviously they scored, they're down 10 points on the road. I'm feeling pretty good uh, having that Colts ticket. Tennessee does it to me again. You know, whether I'm on them or against them, I I just do not have a strong pulse on this team. I'm not going to get involved here, but if we're just talking pure numbers, I think they're slightly overrated here. I mean, for them to be favored by a full touchdown, um, I just don't see it now. They do have the motivation. I mean, they did get absolutely embarrassed in the earlier meeting, 57-14 to to Houston back in October. Obviously, the Texans don't have Deshaun Watson there. Um, Texans have owned the series. They've won and covered seven of the last eight. At six and a half or so, it's slightly in Houston. But am I going to bet the game? Absolutely not. Brad Powers from bradpowersports.com. What's going on over at the website right now, man? Yeah, bradpowersports.com. Uh, dead top of the page. Make sure you're clicking on uh, you know any of the free picks that we have here. And one thing that you can do there uh, when you click on the, the About tab at the top, as you can download past issues of my newsletter, I talk about it each and every week. I like to think it's the most informative newsletter uh, out there as far as the college football and NFL market, specifically college football power ratings on all 130 teams. A lot of guys don't go into that great detail. Computer projected lines, top ATS trends, write-ups on every single college game. I'm not a guy that just does the Power 5. I do all 130 teams, write-ups for every NFL game, top picks of the week. And a whole lot, heck of a lot more. That's the Powers Picks newsletter. If you're interested in signing up, 49 bucks. Not for this week. Not for the NFL. Not for just college football. Not for the Bulls or the NFL playoffs. That's everything. Final week of the college football regular season. You got Army Navy next week. All 40 bowl games where I will have a star rate of play on every bowl game. We like to have fun that time of the year. And there seems to be a lot of value when it comes to bowl time. And obviously all the way through the Super Bowl. 49 bucks. The Powers Picks newsletter. BradPowerSports.com. And that Brad Powers and the number seven on Twitter. Brad, thank you for your time, man. As always, we appreciate it. We'll talk to you again next week. Hey, sounds good. Take care.